तो मेरे बाप जो थे ना मम्मी में आए थे एक बार पहले तो दोबारा से मेरे बाप आए तो मेरे को लेके आए थे कि चलो मुंबई जाएंगे तो हम लोग मुंबई आ गए आने के बाद में यहाँ पर हम लोग मेरे बाप जो फ्रूट धरना करते थे वहाँ मेरी काम में रोसी खाने लगा दिए थे तो संडे वाले दिन हम लोग जो है ना मैच खेला करते थे संडे को और आज संडे को क्या संडे को हम लोग को रोड क्रॉस करने नहीं होता है नगर के अंदर पानी नहीं था तो बहुत बड़ी तकलीफ थी और ये पानी की नहीं यहाँ पर हर चीज की तकलीफ थी कि आदमी जब रहता था ना तो उसको डर लगा रहता था कि हम लोग कैसे जिंदगी काटे हैं यहाँ पर इतने मच्छर काटा करते थे इतना अंधेरा हुआ करता था यहाँ पर अगर आदमी बीमारी भी हो जाता था तो उसको यहाँ से इतनी गाड़ी नहीं मिलती थी कि हम इसको हॉस्पिटल तक पहुँचा दें जबकि यहाँ पर अपना राष्ट्रीय मानक है एक सौ पैंतीस लीटर हर व्यक्ति को प्रतिदिन मिलना चाहिए तो ये तो दो सौ से दो सौ लीटर से ज्यादा पानी देने की क्षमता रखने वाला शहर है उसके पास इतना पानी है उसके बावजूद ये क्यों नहीं दे पा रहा है पानी तो उसका क्लियर रीजन ये है कि इस ये भारतीय जो राजनीति है ये राजनीति ही डिस्क्रिमिनेशन की राजनीति है और इसलिए आज भी मुंबई शहर में 20 लाख लोग जो है उनको पानी नकारा गया है कि आपको नहीं देंगे पानी पानी इतना तकलीफ से हमें मिलता था चार गेलन एक एक साइकिल है जो साइकिल चलाने वाली रहती उसके ऊपर लटका के लेके आते थे और यहाँ पर मट्टी मट्टी इतनी थी पत्थर थे उसके अंदर और ये कीचड़ जब हो जाती थी बारिश में तो साइकिल को धक्का मार लेते थे तो ऐसा लगता था कि अंदर के जो आयत है जो अंदर जो आत रहती है आयत वो साथ मुँह से निकल जाएगी तो हम लोग सोचे तो हमने कि अपनी यहाँ के लिए कुछ करना पड़ेगा तो जगह जगह फिर सब लोग मीटिंग करते थे और एक दिन बड़ी मीटिंग की है तो बोले पानी बस्ती के अंदर होना चाहिए शौचालय बस्ती में होना चाहिए लाइट बस्ती में होना चाहिए तो किस तरह से मिलेगी तो हमारी कुछ समझ में आई तो अगर मैंने सोचा कि हम लोग इस इनसे जुड़ जाएंगे तो हमारी कुछ ना कुछ हल हो सकता है हम लोग इस समझ के हिसाब से बाय पॉलिसी ही लोगों को 
पानी के हद से दूर कर देते हैं कि आप 95 के बाद में आए हो तो आपको पानी नहीं मिलेगा आप 2000 के बाद में आए हो तो भी आपको पानी नहीं मिलेगा आप सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट के जमीन पे हो तो पानी नहीं मिलेगा आप बेघर हो तो पानी नहीं मिलेगा समुद्र के किनारे रहते हो तो नहीं मिलेगा ये जो हमने खुद एक क्लियरली पॉलिसी बनाई कि हम इन लोगों को डिस्क्रिमिनेट करेंगे पानी एक समिति जब जब भी गया कई बस्तियों में लोगों ने हमारे ऊपर हंसे की आप क्या पानी अधिकार की बात करते हो हम तो इलीगल लोग हैं हमको कैसे पानी मिल सकता है तो आपने लोगों की मानसिकता को गुलामी में ढक दिया है कि लोगों ने मान लिया कि वो गुलाम है वो इलीगल है उनका कोई हक नहीं है देखो पानी जो है ना वो पानी किसी की बैटरी में बनता नहीं पानी किसी ने किसी के जागीर से निकलता नहीं किसी की जमीन से नहीं निकलता कोई पैदावार ही नहीं करता तो ये तो ऊपर वाले की देन है तो ये हमारे हक का पानी है दूसरी चीज है कि जो बड़े बड़े लोग हैं जो पैसे वाले लोग हैं इनको पानी मिल जाता है और ये हमसे ज्यादा भी पैसा नहीं दे पाते हैं कि हम उनसे ज्यादा पैसा देके पानी पीते हैं लोग तो बिना पानी के जी नहीं सकते तो इनफॉर्मल वाटर कनेक्शन तो आप उनको देते हो जहाँ फॉर्मल वाटर कनेक्शन वाले कोई साथी जो है वो एक हजार लीटर के लिए पांच रुपया पे करते हैं वहीं पर इनफॉर्मल वाटर कनेक्शन के लिए पांच सौ से सात सौ रुपया पे करना पड़ता है उतने ही पानी के लिए जो उनके आमदनी के बीस या पच्चीस प्रतिशत का रकम है जो आपको सिर्फ पानी के लिए खर्च करना तो आप फिनेंशियली एक्सपर्ट कर रहे हैं उनको उसके बाद में आप उनको कहते हो कि हम आप हमको चुन के दे दो हम अगली बार पानी लेके आएंगे तो ये वोट बैंक करके उनका इस्तेमाल करना उनको एक गुलाम मानसिकता में ढक देना ये यहाँ के पॉलिटिक्स का जरूरत है और वो जरूरत की वजह से ही ये पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ एक्सक्लूजन की वजह से ही आज मुंबई में 20 लाख लोगों के पास पानी जब हम पानी लेने जाया करते थे दूसरे के पास में तो वो लोग आपको किस तरह से बात किया करते थे मुद्दे बहुत से है मगर उन मुद्दों से इसी तरह से जैसे की पानी हक समिति ने पेट्रोल रेट को दुआ है तो हर मुद्दे के अंदर हर जगह घर के अंदर इसी को पेट्रोल रेट को ही तोड़ा जाए तो बाबा अम्बेडकर के कानून को जो संविधान है उसको रोकता है तो वो चीज खत्म करी जाए और इसी तरह से हर किसी इंसान को लड़ना चाहिए और जितने भी एनजीओ हैं जितने भी संस्था हैं सबको एक प्लेटफॉर्म पर आना चाहिए और जब एक प्लेटफॉर्म पर आएंगे तो ही हम लोग को कुछ जीत मिलती है मगर क्या है कि हम भी कभी कभी नेताओं की तरफ बढ़ जाते हैं और वो बढ़ना नहीं कि एक साथ में सब मिलके आ जाएंगे तो हम कुछ ना कुछ जीत हासिल कर सकते हैं और जीत सकते हैं
For this afternoon, we have um, inspiring speakers with uh, the innovations, and we are very ambitious and we're looking forward to great presentation and views for the future. So, uh, the presentation from each speaker will be followed by a Q&A, and at the end, there will be opportunity to, to uh, have a discussion and more general discussion. Before we start, um, I think it is important to recall the quotes from UN World of 2022 that the groundwater may be out of sight, but it must not be out of mind. And we will start with a video message from Eddie Morse, rector of IHE, speaking from the World Conference. Standing here at the uh, World Workforce, with uh, Eddie Morse, just after uh, the opening session. And I just wanted to share with you my presentations of uh, today. Uh, we had an, uh, a long uh, day, but uh, I think also quite an uh, interesting one. A couple of things that uh, I picked up, of course, was uh, the sharing of uh, assessment reports uh, by the GG of uh, UNESCO. Uh, she delivered uh, the first report to the president of uh, Senegal. And also, what was uh, shared here, what uh, interested me, was that uh, the base in the Senegal won the Hustings the second prize because of their, uh, say, collaboration, as they showed, within uh, the, the, this river. And uh, the chair of the jury also called out that uh, he thinks that they should also win the Nobel Prize for the Peace, as they demonstrated in such a very nice way how we could collaborate over borders within uh, the same basin, having different uh, reference uh, for such a river. And I think interesting here as well were uh, the talks that were presented uh, by uh, the president of uh, Ethiopia, also sharing her ideas about uh, what could be done in this collaboration along uh, the river and how the new dam could support not only Ethiopia but also the other countries. So I think that's maybe a nice part of a further discussion that we need to solve our problems here. I would like to stress the fact that uh, groundwater was mentioned uh, quite a lot of times and I do hope that also in the sessions that you will have today that you will discuss uh, those sessions there. Over for now, and uh, I wish you a very good day, uh, World Water Day in uh, 2022. And I hope to report some more things later on when I will uh, be at more events of the World Water Forum. All the best. Okay, um, let's start uh, today's seminar. Uh, the first presenter as an opener is Dr. Nies Harpoch from IEH. Dr. Nies Harpoch is Principal Scientist Geohydrology at KWR Water Research Institute. Guest Associate Professor in Environmental Hydrology at Utrecht University and President of the IAH Netherlands Chapter. Dr. Niels, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I'm still recovering from that video um, uh, about India, re reminding us uh, you know, uh, how basic it can be to, to, to have to struggle and fight for your right. Uh, for uh, access to, to good quality um, water. Um, so, um, thanks to the organizers for having me uh, do the opening today. Um, first of all, I want to start uh, out, um, let's see, first of all, I want to figure this out. Yes, first of all, I want to wish everybody, and I mean everybody, not just here in the room, but also online and everywhere in the, uh, in the world, a very happy, Groundwater, uh, World Groundwater Day. Making the invisible uh, visible. Um, and I, as I was thinking on this, uh, this topic, preparing for, for, for the opening, um, I started thinking on what does this really mean? We all know, we are hydrogeologists, we know that the, the groundwater is under our feet, we cannot see it. The moment we take it out of the ground, we don't call it groundwater anymore. You know, we call it uh, drinking water or uh, service water. So being invisible is really an intrinsic part of groundwater. Of course, I think it also has to do with um, awareness on the existence and importance of groundwater. I think that's where we all need to work together uh, and improve that. So this was the cheerful bit of my presentation. I'm sorry to say, let's go to what we're really facing. There's a global water crisis. And I think this is an illustration of such a crisis that people start thinking of hauling icebergs from Antarctica to South Africa to, to, to supply their water needs. 
Uh, that's, that's in part because groundwater has already been over abstracted, also com uh, contaminated by mining. Yeah, so this is really a sign, yes, we have an illustration of we have a global water crisis. This is another example in, uh, in California uh, where to, to, to prevent and minimize evaporation from the surface storage basins, they've added 96 million shade balls to, to just prevent uh, evaporation from this basin and to deserving the city of Los Angeles. I think these are signs and global change, global warming will only uh, aggravate uh, the crisis that we, we are in. So the question then, is groundwater the solution? We have a, we have a water crisis, is groundwater the solution? Groundwater is such a big part of the whole, uh, of the whole uh, water uh, system on the world that um, it's all connected, so it can't be. It's not a reservoir like oil is that you can just tap uh, and discover. It's all connected, and it, that's something that we have to keep in mind. I think it's very important. Yeah, so if we see signs like this, the drying up of rivers is often associated also with the depletion of groundwater. These systems are connected. Yeah. Floods, yeah. Well, we all know where eh, we need to take out uh, the tiles on our uh, on our gardens, uh, having groundwater infiltrate to prevent this kind of flooding. You yeah, know, the lack of recharge is an important an important aspect. Um, so, is groundwater the solution? Well, in some places, groundwater has not been is present, but has not been accessible yet. Under these conditions, in parts of the world, the UN reports as sub-Saharan Africa, for example, groundwater can be the solution. Very important to consider whether that's renewable groundwater or whether it's fossil groundwater. Yeah, we don't want to get into a situation that we develop a lot, a lot of water demand and then later on uh, find out that we cannot sustain that. Yeah, we're looking all together, I think, how to work towards sustainable water availability everywhere. So that also has to do with controlling demand. So water crisis is a groundwater crisis? Yes, also. Global water crisis is a global groundwater crisis. The, this is just from a reservoir point of view, like you have so many cubic, million cubic uh, kilometers of, of, of groundwater, but it's all connected. So it's not like, oh, let's step into this, into, this, uh, into this source. So groundwater is part of the solution in some places, but certainly is also part of the problem. And we have a long history of, of uh, poor management of, uh, of groundwater resources, over extracting, creating demand, and now we're in a position that we have to deal with that. So yes, we have a groundwater crisis. Recent studies, you know, groundwater on the whole, fresh groundwater availability is shrinking. Uh, we know the issues uh, where we, we're looking for groundwater and, um, and groundwater quality turned out to be a big, a big problem. Wells are drying up, up to 20% globally. That's, that's massive. We have a global groundwater crisis. And um, thinking of closer to home here in the Netherlands, we have our own history. discovering groundwater and mismanaging it. So how can you deal with that? This is the, the June areas in Amsterdam. And uh, in the 1850s, water, up to the 1850s, water was just taken from the canals. And you can imagine there was a lot of microbial contamination in there. June water was much better quality. So we started pumping June water, first from canals, later on with deeper wells. So that's the red here in the figure. Uh, as those canals dried up, um, the pumping started from deeper uh, uh, June water. But the demand was higher than the dunes were able to provide. So that's when started infiltrating river water into the dunes. And we're still doing that, doing that today. Managed aquifer recharge is one of the solutions when you're stuck in a situation where the demand is structurally higher than what you can provide. Yeah, so this is 
in a situation where you're already so what makes a water crisis in general and how can you deal with that so what I'm saying is about availability and demand you know you have different sources of water yeah? more and more we're looking into into uh, treated wastewater for example um, with managed aquifer recharge schemes to enhance the recharge of aquifers and you have water demand and also the demand for different purposes has a, a volumetric component but also a quality component yeah? so if the availability is greater than the demand you have a mismatch and uh, this mismatch can be temporal yeah? you have the water but not at the right time you have the water but not at the right quality or you have the water but it's somewhere else so the solutions for these kind of conditions, we can think along the lines of storage solution for the temporal problem. So managed aquifer recharge is one of the, the, the ways to, uh, to deal with uh, aquifer storage and recovery, for example. Of course, we know treatment, but there's a very um, 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 there's a very wide range of different kind of treatment technologies. It can be it can be sufficient to just infiltrate the water into an aquifer, like in the dune area to remove uh, pathogens, for example. But if we want to turn saline water, seawater, into fresh drinking water, it's going to take a lot of energy and, and effort. So we want to stay away from these, these, these more intensive, uh, also from the energy transition point of view. And of course, pipelines are a way to, 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 to deal with the location uh, mismatch. But that can be as simple as a pipe straight down if there's groundwater available at depth that's not been accessed before. So just a couple of examples from uh, uh, from the research in uh, at KWR and, and, and working with, 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 with students. So this is in Abu Dhabi, an area where you have 100 millimeters per year natural recharge. But there's millions of people living there. Yeah. So what is there the source for water? It's the uh, desalination of um, water from the uh, from the coast um, but uh, the demand uh, varies and sometimes the water intake cannot happen because of algae blooms and of course in this region they also consider the the, the possibilities of uh, of hostile um, uh, hostile uh, break uh, breaks for example so managed active recharge you see it on the on the left hand side infiltrating uh, water into the dune area area uh, in, into the desert area desalinated water to have a storage for, for a couple of months to be available. Another example, 10 times more precipitation, Gisborne, New Zealand, you see very green, green area. But just to illustrate, demand is so high there because they are producing citrus, yeah, uh, kiwis, all these kind of things, really high demand. <coughs> and this aquifer underlaying this, this floodplain mm. is salinizing. So what we're doing here is introducing river water into that into that aquifer and actually the river water quality is better than the the water that's naturally present there so recharging desalinated water um, in abu dhabi recharging river water in in new zealand infiltrating uh, river water in the dunes in the netherlands what are we doing basically we're making the visible invisible yeah we're turning water that we can see we're putting it under underground and that can improve the quality that allows us to store the water. Um, so really, I think we should try and see the beauty of invisibleness. Yeah, and that's that's, uh, that's a bit a bit complicated, but I think that's what we should just accept and and, and, and cherish. I think the biggest component of the visibility is the awareness part. I mean, I don't have to. <laughs> You all know about groundwater, but do your parents, do your friends know about groundwater and, and what it means uh, to us and how interconnected the different components of the water cycle are? Because I think it would be a mistake for us as groundwater professionals to be, think, ah, great, finally we have our moment, our shining moment of groundwater in the spotlight. Uh, now it's our turn. I think we should highlight the interaction, the connectedness <coughs> with the other components with rivers, water, uh, lakes, um, how our rainwater turns into groundwater, etc. What's the nice thing also about this graph, 
this water cycle is 100% solar powered. Yeah? Let's try to stick close to the natural processes. And let's work our best in also um, conveying that message of groundwater being a part of a natural solar powered circular systems. These are some of the buzzwords uh, that, that people, people can, uh, can relate uh, uh, to. Drinking water, yeah, drinking water. Why not call it aerated groundwater? I mean, in the Netherlands, 60% uh, comes straight from groundwater. Uh, the rest, mostly, uh, uh, is dune infiltration or riverbank infiltration. It's all, 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 all been there. It's been there. It's been in the, in the subsurface. It's been in the underground. It carries the signature of groundwater. So drinking water is, uh, is aerated groundwater. Or drinking water is, is drinkable groundwater. I think this is a way, and I'm kind of half joking, I think this is kind of a way to get in the ears, in the minds of people not familiar with groundwater, is, ah, drinkable groundwater. So it's really a challenge, and I dug a little bit deeper, and this is just to give you some thoughts and ideas, and hopefully in inspire uh, good discussions also with the, with the coming presentations that go into more depth. It's really not the invisibility has not to do with the size of, of, of the groundwater uh, availability. I mean, there's so much groundwater, even with these depletions that are going on. But if we look at this graph, I started looking at the, the image at the report. And I was happy to notice some, some wind turbines in the back because water energy nexus is very important. We need to transition to sustainable water and sustainable energy. Yeah. Looking at these, 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 these rivers there in the city, I think, how can you really make it personal? And then I started thinking, oh, wow. So. If, if, at least in Holland, you know, and globally it's 50%, but in Holland it's almost 100% water has been in touch with the subsurface. So the drinking water is, is drinkable groundwater. And if our bodies, on average, contain 60% of water, now wait a minute, our blood consists of 95% of water. It carries the signature of groundwater. So go out there and spread <laughs> and spread the message. Groundwater is in our veins. And I know it's in all your veins, metaphorically, but literally it's in everybody's veins. And I think we need to get that message across. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this uh, nice opening uh, of today. Um, I think you already introduced us to the importance of groundwater and uh, how it can be, how there can be problems with it, uh, and how it's important for solutions as well. Um, so that is a nice uh, way into our second speaker, um, who will also discuss the importance of the groundwater theme. Uh, so I want to uh, ask Elisabeth. To, uh, join us here. So, Elisabeth is the director of uh, the International Groundwater Resources Assessment Center, ICHAC, uh, since January. Um, she's a hydrogeologist and has 26 years of worldwide experience as a consultant, project manager, researcher, and R&D center director in diverse contexts, so different regions of the world, different sectors, and different fields of intervention. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much to the organizers and to the participants to be here. So, I will start uh, by a question for you. <laughs> there is a lot of students, so um, I'm new in the Netherlands, so I went uh, uh, to the bathroom of uh, IHE and took a glass of water and I was wondering if this water is groundwater. Do you know? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I, have, I, have a, I have an excuse, I'm new. But I've done some homework, yeah? I went to, to I found that uh, in Delft, uh, the, the company that is supplying uh, water, uh, drinking water, and the, 
water in general, is um, Wassen, and it, it, uh, this company take water from a peatland area called uh, Green Herd, no? And from, as the mail said, from river bank infiltration. This is interesting because the company said it is a surface groundwater company, no? So I was wondering, surface groundwater, yeah. But it's because the groundwater at the end uh, is just infiltrated by the, uh, through the river bank, and yeah, before being groundwater, it is surface water, it is rainwater, no? And it will become again ground surface water after. Um, so now you know this is groundwater from a <laughs> river bank infiltration. So that's uh, just a way to uh, um, show that uh, 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 we have to to um, to to. To look for information, to be aware uh, that uh, 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 about what uh, impact us every day, and uh, um, so I will share with you. Now I will go to ground level, and I will share you, with you this picture from uh, the uh, this picture has been taken in the north of Chile, Atacama Desert. This is an oasis, um, and when I when I arrived there in uh, 2011, 2012. Uh, all farmers and uh, uh, the people that were living in this oasis and depending on groundwater because in arid areas all life depends on groundwater there is no surface water there is no rain even here and um, we're really worried because uh, levels were declining uh, they were uh, really uh, they, they were saying that it was the fault of a mining company but which was located with very far 100 kilometers away and that we, we were not able to know so yeah i was very surprised because i said okay so we are going to we are sending uh, robots to march and we don't know uh, we are not able to understand what is happening there in a shallow aquifer, some few meters under our feet, um, in, uh, uh, and the same in many places of the world. Ten years later, we generated a lot of information on this place, and at the end, not so much has changed for the people. They are still declining water, groundwater level, salinization, etc. So, this is really much more complex. Um, um, you can have access. At information is the is the is at is at core of the problem. Data, and this is what IGREC uh, is working on. Um, but once you have the information, the scientific validated information, how you get it to the people that need this information to take decision, it's still a strong challenge. No. And I think that this is where I think we are maybe all or almost all scientific people or at least um, uh, come with, we come from a scientific background and this is where I think we have to be uh, creative. Um, um, there is many challenges around groundwater because of course of, of, of course because of its hidden characteristic and um, uh, uh, so uh, this is the, the, this is not only a matter of we have today all the technology and the method so, most of all the methodologies to understand what is happening on the ground there. You know, uh, this is not a matter of uh, uh, of course we can always improve the methodologies that we are using, but we have it. We can do, yeah. So, where is the problem? Of course, financing is a, 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 um, a very important issue. Um, but how we can really um, uh, transmit and uh, this, this scientific information to the people who will use it to improve groundwater management? This is a question. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, the answer. Uh, and I hope that uh, um, in the year to come, uh, 
we are able to, to, to give more and more and so maybe some speakers later can give some insights or some experience on how we can uh, really improve the situation on the ground. But now I will jump to the yeah. Okay, I will I jump because my uh, uh, speech now was to talk about the importance of the groundwater year. So, Nate uh, says that we have to work on awareness, we have to work on uh, spreading the word and explaining there is a huge work need on that. And we have to be creative on the way we are do, uh, uh, doing that. But also there is a lot of happening at global level, no? So this is what uh, now I will just uh, show you with this. Uh, um, there will be a, a lot of uh, event, important event uh, this year. The first one is the World Water Forum in Dakar, that uh, where uh, Eddie is now. Um, and uh, uh, after Dakar, uh, so uh, we, we are in uh, 2022, um, uh, there is a lot of uh, other uh, uh, events uh, in Japan, in Portugal, in Tajikistan with a high level international conference um, for, uh, in, June, in June and then between July and December or so we have the World Water, uh, the, um, water, um, World water Week in Stockholm uh, we have a high level uh, political forums or so uh, and we have a very important event at the end of the year, which is uh, uh, the Groundwater Summit, uh, which will happen in Paris. Um, why all that? No? Um, sometimes, of course, there is a lot of disconnect disconnection between the ground level and uh, the picture before and this global level. Um, uh, in this global level, uh, all the issues are uh, discussed, like, for example, in, in, in Dakar now, uh, challenges with uh, uh, the people that uh, can take decisions no, on, on water and on groundwater. But, of course, we hope for, for the participation of as much um, practitioners, scientists as possible, uh, so the outcomes uh, of all those events, individual events, will be will be used to uh, make a statement and be, will be bring to the Groundwater Summit in December in Paris uh, on groundwater. And this uh, this messages uh, or this or this message uh, will be bring brought then next year, in 2023, to the UN Water Conference in uh, New York. Um, this, is, this conference will be the half uh, decade, I mean, we are in the decade, the water decade, 2018-2028, and uh, this UN Water Conference will assess uh, uh, where we are uh, um, regarding the objectives set up during, for this decade um, at uh, midterm, which is next year. So the challenge is to bring groundwater to this uh, UN Water Conference, and uh, basically, it's uh, on my in my opinion uh, to uh, the, the objective of the challenge is to ensure that we are able to mainstream groundwater in all other water uh, issues. Yeah, in the in, meaning that if we speak about integrated water management, it's really uh, it, groundwater is is included, or all the the if we speak about water financing, we include groundwater and all other um, water policy all water policy should uh, have a groundwater uh, policy and uh, before I was uh, speaking about Chile this is uh, then again a challenge because uh, the water the groundwater was added to the water policy but at the end uh, uh, so groundwater is managed like surface water so but it's not the same it cannot be managed in the same way and there is a lot of examples like that so this is the 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 objective of the groundwater year um, 
is of course to raise awareness to all of us so we can uh, know when we are drinking groundwater and we know what are the processes uh, that are uh, happening when uh, we we understand them and uh, but also at the same time at global level uh, so we can ensure that uh, groundwater is meant, is included in all the, the, the water challenges that uh, the, we are facing. So basically this is uh, my uh, message for you today and um, uh, I wish you also a very nice uh, groundwater day. <laughs> Before we're moving to the next presentation, I will. I want to uh, thank for the video that we watched uh, before it even starts. It's uh, Isa Kapani. Uh, the film uh, was made by N Contractor and Jayan Marashar. And it's about the Salamanese decade long journey to access the right of water and also a political side to the right to life guaranteed by the Constitution of India. And through the film, to this journey, with, uh, they take a glimpse into the lives of Mumbai's urban poor, the political and systemic ingest, uh, into the lives of Mum <laughs> systemic injustice they face when they are trying to access water and sanitation, as well as the ongoing efforts of the citizen collectives to reform this system. And also, uh, after uh, before the discussion, we will also watch another movie. It is a wake up call by Lani Cinema. Uh, now, the next presenter is uh, Albert Tenhoff from NICC. Albert Tenhoff is a groundwater management expert formerly working with the Akashia Water and Pfizer to the World Bank with a focus on groundwater in the form of Africa. With the NICC, we make timelines. Timelines are, uh, are, are uh, an overview yeah, of what happened on a certain topic. Uh, object, uh, subject over time, yeah, and we do it in a range, a wide range of fields of, of topics. But water is the most important one, and we have already completed ten, and one of them is on groundwater. So that's the reason why I am here today, yeah, to share with you some insights we had in preparing this timeline together. So a timeline is this series of bullets, and if you <coughs> You can also download them from the NICC uh, uh, website, and under each bullet, yeah, there is a story, yeah, and it's a story which explains yeah, the topic and it refers directly to PDFs, uh, videos, uh, and other background material. And so the graph of the timeline is built up. From, say the first five bullets are just to explain and discuss some topics typical topics on groundwater and the last five bullets are examples cases yeah, which emerging topics yeah, on groundwater which emerged in the five decades which were covered from 1970 to 2020 so now let me first go and the same to the cycle which already was presented by Niels uh, groundwater has a special relationship with time yeah, and that's why I show this. Thing. This is the hydrologic cycle, and a drop is called groundwater once it infiltrated yeah, from the surface into the into the, uh, the subsoil. And then, yeah, a water drop can either uh, follow a one or two days or one year yeah, voyage before it comes back to the system in through springs or when it's discharged to surface water. But other drops yeah, stay there for centuries or millennia. Yeah? So a lot of water drops in the soil have no idea on what happens on the ground. That this whole climate change and all those things are, are just yeah, not known to them. Because they are there for such a long time. Yeah? So there is so we have to to know that you know there is so much water deep down yeah, on groundwater, yeah, which is there for a long time. Yeah, and which we can use. Yeah? I come to that later. But there is another timeline in groundwater. Yeah? And that has to do with the management. And typically there are four steps yeah, if you going to use groundwater. First you have to know where it is, the assessment. Yeah? The second step is to get it out of the subsoil, get it out of the aquifers. So that's the 
call it the development or the exploitation. And then that needs to go together with management to make sure yeah, that it's a long-term yeah, thing, yeah, that it's not going to be spoiled in a short time. And management can only be practiced if you have monitoring data. So assessment, development, management and monitoring are the th three core elements yeah, of successful groundwater use. But the reality, <coughs> it goes more like in this slide. Yeah. The assessment, that's the domain of the hydrogeologists, yeah, they find a good aquifer, say, okay, here you can drill a well of 100 meter and get your water. So people start drilling, and one well is very successful, and the second one also, and, and it can up, go up to 50 or 100 wells, yeah, and it seems that the resource is infinite yeah, compared to the abstraction. But without management, yeah, because management is not at it's not a point at that in that phase, yeah. So there is no thinking of management. But at a certain point of time, yeah, there will be a call for action. Either levels drop, water quality deteriorates, or land subsides, yeah. So there is a point, yeah, where there is action needed, and then management becomes a big need, yeah, to resolve those conflicts. So that's where management comes in. But it's too late, yeah. So managed development yeah, is then uh, needed, but it will not solve most of the problems yeah, which could have been avoided if management could be in place from the beginning. And monitoring, of course, is related to that. Yeah? It, it monitoring is needed to do your management, otherwise you're not uh, aware of the type of measures and the impacts of it. And now the impacts of this are very well known, especially from the past, this is the example of Sana, where the water level dropped more than 140 meters, yeah, because of uh, the land subsidence in the Joachim Valley in California, which started already early in the last century, but in the last, what is it, uh, 50 years, yeah, it dropped again another nine meters, or three meters, yeah. And of course, the, the well known example in Punjab, the Green Revolution in India, where one and a half million wells were drilled without any management, yeah? except for the distance between the wells. But there were, were no further management rules. And now, 30, 40 years later, it has become a disaster. Yeah? The water levels drop, the water is polluted, and the rural water supply systems in the same area, this is the small, the rural water supply schemes are also affected by arsenic and many other pollutants. So now there is mentioning of management, but it's actually too late. Yeah? There are too many of those wells, and it will be very difficult to make a turn in providing safe water for everybody without large uh, impacts on the, on the population or on the economy. Now, those same four steps, assessment, development, and management, are also kind of framework for See, what are the main changes in groundwater uh, and, and developments over the, the last 50 years? Yeah? So if you look to assessment, it starts in the 70s, it was very locally. It was geologists who went to the field using aerial photographs, information of existing wells. And that developed yeah, now in the, over the time with all kind of new tools and information sources. Yeah? Geophysics, isotopes, GIS, you can name it, up to the the global data sets, remote sensing data sets, it will be presented later. And the same actually for monitoring. It also started very locally with handheld tools or even paper uh, 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 <coughs> files. Yeah? And it also developed yeah, via automatic monitoring, uh, computer applications, GPS, etc. Also to real-time data models yeah, which are available today. On the development, it's interesting to see that in the 70s, more or less, yeah, the, the groundwater was local, it was a local resource, yeah, tapped by shallow wells, duck well springs. And over the years, the groundwater was tapped deeper and deeper, yeah, so, till, so deeper drilling started in the 80s, up to 400 meters drilling. It's now often in, also in African countries, yeah, and recently, yeah, the first wells up to 600 meters were drilled in Ethiopia and in Tanzania. So it goes deeper and deeper, yeah, 
as long as the quality of the water allows for it. But in the same time, the, the linkage with surface water, and Niels already mentioned that also, we see it for a long time already, that riverbank infiltration, consumptive use, yeah, and more recently, the last 10, 15 years, the managed aquifer recharge, also is a very clear development, yeah, a very promising one, yeah, to make uh, groundwater more uh, effective and more uh, in reach of people. On the management, uh, it was also a very, uh, very local, yeah, localized solution, localized uh, uh, conflict resolution in the 70s. Now with all the insights and with the, not only models, but also the insights through IWRM and uh, uh, groundwater government, <coughs> it has become a much uh, kind of complete uh, system yeah, to guide the development. But still, it often comes uh, too late to become uh, be effective enough. Now, in the timeline we have of those four, we have kind of case studies, yeah, which are presented yeah, uh, in the five bullets at the end, and you can just see them if you, uh, if you open the, the timeline uh, through NICC. Now, to conclude with, I think, Making groundwater visible, I think groundwater has become more visible than it was in the past. Especially the four, it's, it's more and more recognition yeah, that groundwater has these specific advantages. Yeah, that it's available when needed, it's a decentralized resource. Yeah, and so it's, a, it's the source yeah, for safe water for rural and small town water supply. It's our largest reservoir. That's, yeah, seen in the first slide. Yeah. So it's still a lot of water there yeah, uh, which we can use yeah, and uh, which we can develop if we develop the right technology and the management uh, uh, tools with it. And there the mar, it's already mentioned, the mar is the most important one. Yeah? Of course aquifers are not only groundwater in the aquifers, but the aquifer itself, yeah, the medium can be used to store water to bridge dry periods. And it's also still an untapped resource because yeah, we never we have we don't use the brackish groundwater resources which are still untapped, largely untapped, and the deeper aquifers which I mentioned already. And of course then the natural protection of water, yeah, groundwater against uh, pollution and evaporation. And also, it's, there's more and more recognition that groundwater is more than only a source of water for drinking water supply. There are these other, yeah, more increasingly important uh, uh, characteristics, yeah? the stable temperature as a source of renewable energy, the environmental function to provide base flow to wetlands, and the natural treatment of aquifers yeah? for natural remediation. So, I think groundwater has good potential and we have to make more promotion of these kind of characteristics of groundwater yeah, to make it uh, accepted and more recognized by the broader audience. And I think on top of everything is this managed aquifer recharge. Uh, because that has a large potential. I'm working now in Somalia and in Ethiopia for the World Bank. And you see that this is the solution. Yeah? You can drill more deep wells in Somalia. You can try to find more uh, locations for shallow wells. But catching up the water in the wadis yeah? with this type of systems to, to store the water yeah? when there is runoff and use it during the dry season is, is a fantastic way of supplying water in dry, remote areas. And I think it's good to see the World Bank has now the first large project in Somalia where they built 30 or 40 of these systems in, uh, in Puntland and also in other parts of uh, East Africa. You see a lot of attention and a lot of investments in this uh, managed aquifer recharge. And I'm happy that here in the Netherlands a lot of organizations including Acacia but also uh, uh, other NGOs and small firms uh, have contributed a lot to that in the last 15 years. Yeah, by uh, describing the cases, publishing books and promoting it uh, wherever they are in, uh, in the dry parts of this world. So 
I think this makes groundwater a solution. Yeah? It's not an invisible resource. This, for many users on the ground, yeah? managed aquifer recharge, these structures which you can see, yeah? the structures, the sand dams are not underground, they are visible. Yeah? And people see that thanks to these dams in which they often contributed yeah? in building them, they see that even at the end of the dry season there is still water which was not there in the past. And the dams are only one, there are many other technologies, but uh, I think this is something we can really kind of uh, promote yeah, as a solution in groundwater rather than uh, an invisible resource which, yeah, which you can only tap if you have the knowledge or if you have the tools yeah, to, to know where it is and to know how to get it, uh, uh, to get it at the surface. I will skip this one. This will come later, I think, with the next presentation. But this remote sensing, both on the on the uh, on the design side of the, the mapping side, but also on the uh, on the monitoring and the management, yeah, are I think tools which are extremely powerful and easy yeah, to access. Yeah, and I think both this remote sensing for uh, mapping. Uh, data sets for groundwater mapping and the water productivity for, uh, for uh, managing and monitoring uh, the, uh, the, the water productivity in dry areas are extremely effective tools. So we should really continue to invest in them and uh, make them more accessible. But at the end, all those technologies yeah, will only be uh, effective yeah, if they are embedded yeah, in the non-technical environment yeah, and if they are linked to legal and managerial capacities, if they are linked to the communities yeah, who are to work and to use them, if they are payable, if they are linked to the correct economic and financial capacities and also the institutional capacities to manage them at the different levels. So investment in knowledge and investment in tools is extremely important but always we have to make sure that they fit into the broader picture of groundwater governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert, for your uh, presentation. Um, yeah, it was very interesting to also hear a bit about the historical developments of uh, the things we're talking about now. Um, so for the next presentation, we're going to go a bit more to the present and the future because I want to invite Gu uh, to join the stage. Um, Gu is a hydro hydrogeologist, uh, works at Deltares and also at Utrecht University one day a week. Uh, and he will give us a presentation about, about groundwater in the Netherlands. Yeah, thank you both for introducing me. Thanks for uh, also being here. Uh, interesting uh, seeing nice uh, young people at the back and also in front that uh, are part of this, uh, this whole story of, of groundwater. Uh, I want to focus on groundwater in the Netherlands, uh, key to uh, resilient and sustainable future. I have some topics here. I'm, or, or we are already behind time, eh? so I try to stick with 15 minutes, but I don't do less. So that is clear, otherwise I cannot <laughs> make it, right? Um, and on top of that, I thought, um, also now, maybe for discussion later, more knowledge doesn't mean we will um, smarter use this water. So if you have more knowledge, you maybe extract more. So before knowing more, maybe we should also think about schemes or governance that we smart to use this water and we talked about mar but maybe uh, we don't need that first we need to know uh, are there alternatives maybe uh, saving water water saving acti activities maybe uh, using um, um, water brackish water as a hotel later maybe using uh, solar system crops so also from the part of water saving i think we can do a lot instead of only knowing more of the resources and getting more out i think also we should directly think about using less that's a bit to start with. Anyway, uh, the arrows, I said news. News, we had some overlap, but it's clear because we work together also with PhDs. I am in Daltares, which is an independent uh, research institute on the soil, water, and infrastructure. Independent, not for profit. Uh, we want to bridge uh, research, applied research to, uh, to application. We want to go for integrated knowledge and innovation in the field of water and soil. 
and we have basically a few missions. We want to help others, uh, clients, stakeholders, uh, governments, the governmental institutes, also uh, companies into uh, future delta, sustainable delta, uh, safe delta, and infra infrastructure. So we want to share our knowledge from the Netherlands, also with our colleagues, like they do uh, to the universities, towards other people. I really like the concept of dare to share because we need this sharing, because we need to uh, uh, contribute to the society and share this knowledge we have in certain projects, also especially in the international setting. I come to that later. Um, now, we work together with other people, other institutes on close and water uh, balance, also in the Netherlands. Though you think we are a water-rich country, we still have water scarcity, especially in the summertime. You can see here the water shortages, uh, the dry season in international settings, I would say, not the, uh, the summertime or wintertime, it's called the dry season. And we have some challenges. It's, uh, we want to use the subsurface as a solution for uh, water supply. Now we come to that later. Uh, but it's, it's difficult because there are many stakeholders, many functions. We want to also increase the present groundwater resources because we think this is a precious resource and we want to use it for future, for future generations. So apart from uh, getting more out, uh, make our economy working, uh, properly working, uh, getting a lot of food production. We are very good at food production, we need good water quality. We still want to preserve water for the future. So that's, that's giving us more trouble, of course. And on this side, you can see that many ask, many people ask water from us. Um, now you see the list: uh, drinking water, agriculture, uh, peat areas, etc., etc. So uh, there's a lot, of, lot of kind of demands, and that's difficult. On top of that, we have a coastal, yeah, just a small area in, in the world. It's only a, a small stamp compared to big uh, countries, but we have a lot, of, also a lot of uh, saline groundwater. And that's because of the, the history. In the past, sea level was higher, there was no dam, no, no sand dune area, so we were flooded all the time. We have a lot of salt in the subsurface, so it's not fresh water resource you can extract. It's also mixed with salt water, and that is bad, because if you mix only one liter salt with 170 liter fresh water, you, you can already start to taste it. You can already see that certain crops are already vulnerable to this water content. So that's really a tricky system. And on top of that, I mentioned some concepts. Um, I will only want to take out this one. When you extract too much in a saline area, you can have upcoding. And the difficult thing over there is if you extract normal volumes, you can very rapidly have upcoding in this extraction well. You think that suddenly the concentration is too high and you stop. But really, before it takes the system of salt water getting down, that can take maybe 10 times more time. So upcoding is maybe five years and it takes maybe 50 years before the salt water goes down. So you can destroy it easily, re, um, re, re in, yeah, let's say make the system fresh again, it takes maybe 10 times more time. That's important to remember when you talk about groundwater in the coastal zone. On top of that, in the Netherlands, and uh, folks in the Netherlands, we see that there are a lot of kind of stresses. It's sometimes too wet, sometimes it's possible prone to flooding, it's possible prone to dry periods. It can be end dry and it can be too wet. It can be too sanalized. So in the Netherlands, you see for all the colors, and all those legenda is too small for you now, maybe you can check later. So there are many possible problems. Too wet, too dry, too salty, too low. And all those issues also trouble our system. On top of that, of course, in the future system with sea level rise, with substance, as I said, maybe changing policy. Yeah, but also, humans' activities are very important, for instance, from, from extraction policy, basically. It all matters to us and all affects the groundwater issue. And last, as an introduction, I say that if you are checking out the future of the Netherlands in case of extreme sea level rise, now I think in, in 2100 we, just, we think about 80 centimeters only, but maybe it can go up higher, we don't know yet. IPCC said maybe it can go up to 2 meters, maybe 3 meters, which is extreme high, but it might be possible. That means that maybe for the Netherlands we have to think about other solutions. They were very low lying. Maybe we have to think about closing the Netherlands, maybe open up the Netherlands. You see all the effects of that, uh, the sketches. Maybe we have to go seaward, maybe we have to just retreat. And that all will affect the groundwater system. So these concepts, as I wrote down here, they are not yet uh, understood and understand. And uh, we didn't check out what would be the effect of all those higher level, highest level uh, effects of how we cope with extreme sea level rise on our groundwater system. So it's still research that we have to check out. 
Anyway, from, yeah, from my point of view, groundwater plays an important role. You can see the list, one to four ecosystem services. It is important for the, for as a solution, as already explained, for the transition in many things, in, in water transition, in energy, in food and in nature. We all need this groundwater source as a part of the solution to solve this transition and to, to, to make the transition, transition happen. And the last part, of course, the sustainable development goals, uh, the, the 17 goals, the Green Deal in Europe, the natural uh, system of managers, they all are into trouble. And if you don't have groundwater around, you will not solve easily those problems. And here I just mentioned a few deltas, together work in many other institutes like KWR and universities, where we work on. And also very important, but governance is always part of the game. So we can invent technical solutions, but we cannot implement it properly if we don't have the governance directly with this kind of projects. I have now a few examples. <coughs> now this is an example Niels already told. That's overlap, of course, Niels. And we already 65, yes, 65 years ago, we already started up with one of the first in Europe, at least maybe in the, in the whole of the world, the first aqua storage and recovery system, right? The many aqua for recharge. That was happening in the time, in Amsterdam Waterworks, I think. And, and it really worked pretty well. Why was it needed? It was needed because people extracted too much and they were sold upcoming in those wells, as I already explained to you. Second one is now the project will work based on old stuff, eh? basically stuff already 65 years ago. We now basically kind of reinvent this concept of using the subsurface as a solution for water storage. And we call it here the Costa concept, which is also part of KWR. You don't see it in the corner news, but behind there you are KWR and Agaris, of course. It's here in the sheet. And it's about uh, yeah, um, large scale use of the subsurface for a robust water supply and water management system. And we see this concept uh, applicable around many areas around the world where there's a water scarcity and where there's salinization issues. That's a coastal zone. And basically what we want, and that's on top of what Neil said at this corner, um, we want water for different kinds of end users with have different kinds of um, demands, let's say. Yeah, sometimes wants fresh water, sometimes maybe brackish water at the right volume, the right quality, the right place, the right moment for reasonable costs. And that is difficult. There's often not enough, maybe the quality is not good enough, and really trying to mix, mix that up to make that match is very difficult and within certain research programs, AquaConnect supported by the Dutch government, uh, NWO, so basically scientific funding, we try to try uh, to make up this kind of system that we try to match all in, in this context water for the right uh, end use. So these are examples of coaster. It's in the special this one, Niels did mention it, but it's in the Dunea area. We work with PhDs on really implementing, monitor, doing really this aqua storage and recovery. And it's not in fresh water, but it's now in brackish water is in included here. We want to extract brackish water, we want to purify it, even say desalination, desalinization, and then bring this brine water to the sea. The concentration is still lower than sea water, sea water level, uh, sea uh, concentration. And in that setting, we think that it is feasible to increase the volume while still extracting a large amount of water for drinking water supply. Uh, another kind of innovation, I would say, in the Netherlands, and I just checked around, about 20 years ago, I saw the first time this concept in the Everglades, also old stuff, and it's come from the oil industry. And they did this survey and we said, ah, this is not possible. You cannot detect with a helicopter or an airplane, an, an, an airplane, you cannot detect the salinity in the subsurface. Uh, so we were very skeptical 20 years ago. And we then suddenly uh, saw it possible. We checked it out in a European project and suddenly we saw it is possible to have this airborne survey and then you can map the three-dimensional uh, groundwater salinity. And now recently, we also know that you can map the clay layers. They're important for for storing water, of course. If you don't have clay layers, it, may, it affects the infiltration capacity. And we did it in Zeeland um, seven years ago, 1.4 million euros. And now we do the national scale based on some funding from local area, local partners, and also with partners from the uh, national Dutch government. And we see that this is a very nice innovation coming from old industry, oil and gas, already invented 20 years ago, but now with new ideas, new 
finish with touch ideas that we know we can really use this knowledge for strategic groundwater resource management, maybe for better aquasource and recovery system, maybe also implement where we can do brackish groundwater extraction. And lastly, we can use this knowledge to infiltrate or implement that in the models to have better models for future predictions. So this kind of project uh, is made in total, let's say, 5 million eh, for all of the Netherlands. And I think in, in, if you go to Egypt, 10 million, 50 million for the Nail Delta, it looks like a lot of money, but it's not compared to normal data collection. And certainly you have this result already within one year. The last thing, from a Dutch point of view, this is our national model, national water model, natural hydrological model, only in the Denmark, also a small country, we have these kind of models. And we have these models because we want to understand how a different kind of drivers will affect our water management. So these models are created already 15 years ago, it cost us a lot of money, some people very skeptical about it, didn't believe it, they say this is wrong, it's not good enough, it's not fast enough, that's still difficult by the way, but we continue to do that, this for the national government and now suddenly these kind of tools are used for water management, water management, groundwater management, so these tools are supporting decision making, supporting policy making and that is nice because we can now have scientifically based knowledge implementing in water management and policy and that is then scientifically based off and that I think like a lot and we're just starting by the way because now we have recollected that we can much faster model we can use parallel computing supercomputers and we can much more easily do more simulations and that helps us better understand how the system works and how uncertain the results are uh, for the internal setting, there's only a few seats to finish. Like, well, what I say now is just to Netherlands, but of course, and I work in Egypt and then um, also Bangladesh a bit and Vietnam. Basically, the, the, the problems are the same. What we have as a problem, maybe a small problem, it's much bigger in Bangladesh. And, and, and I would like to share this kind of knowledge we have. And we also want to learn from other countries to have a better mutual uh, idea of what is the problem and how can we solve it. And groundwater is there uh, for a part of it. Um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, it's, it's not uh, small stuff because more than 200 million people living in these th three different kinds of uh, deltas, they are into trouble from water management or water supply point of view. In the Mekong Delta, uh, they told me, the farmers say, if I don't have water next year, because it was last year, it was very dry, if I don't once again have water enough, then I have to, go my, have to uh, stop my uh, agriculture activity and have to go to the city. And over Egypt, over there, if the water quality stays so bad, they cannot sell the crops in a good price anymore. So that kind of trouble they are in daily. And that means that if they continue on that, they have to stop over there. And um, to finish, uh, the reflections, partly what I already said, um, now, groundwater system is under uh, increasing stress. I think it's key for the transition in water, food, energy, and nature, it can be an eco service uh, for the future, and it's important for that. I think before really to implement uh, yeah, a sustainable and resilient pathways or solutions, we need uh, more knowledge about how it really works. As I said, the airborne survey, maybe the modeling, the data, the modeling, and the monitoring. That's important to implement to get an idea of how it works and how it will react to solutions. And then I would like to share our knowledge. Uh, with other areas around the world and also want to collect knowledge that we have a mutual knowledge level good enough to support people in making the right decisions and the last uh, framing idea I have here yeah brackish groundwater is new fresh so I think opportunities over there are a lot and we should go into that more than we do now but that I leave it okay <laughs> And now we will move to a more specific topic about remote sensing in the management of groundwater resources. Uh, I want to invite uh, Marius to the stage to tell us more. Marius is an associate professor at IHU Delft, currently coordinating the water accounting group using remote sensing. And she also coordinates the IHU Delft activities of the FAO Light Vapor Project, which covers Africa and the Middle East. Thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, remote sensing and how that can be uh, useful for groundwater and groundwater assessments. Uh, Gu already uh, showed a very nice example of how something, you know, looking from uh, the top, you can uh, provide, you can still get a lot of uh, nice information to help you uh, better understand the groundwater resources uh, and to support that. Um, so just as an introduction, um, well, some innovations um, in remote sensing, so the innovation really related to the remote sensing, and we see more and more products becoming available that monitor the different uh, components of the water cycle. And you can think about precipitation, you can think about uh, evapotranspiration, you think about storage strains change, um, and uh, if you, the GRACE uh, product actually measures the gravity of the earth and the only changes that you find, beside of course the volcanoes, is the change in, in water storage. Um, and of course the water storage, uh, you've got the surface water storage and the groundwater storage, but it provides a lot of information around the changes in availability of water resources. Uh, it also, there are products that provide information around soil moisture. Um, that information is often uh, really the, the top soil, uh, but there are also estimates on providing more information about deeper um, up to root zone estimates. So these are some of the, the elements that can be measured from uh, remote sensing products. We see also over the last decades, the quality of the different products is improving, uh, the, the spatial resolution of the products is improving and also the temporal resolution. So it's unfortunately still not uh, at the same level as the ground observation that you, where you have uh, sometimes daily data, but it is uh, providing a lot of information, especially at the spatial scale. And uh, we also see there's a lot of stories about um, the availability of, of data and the quality of the data. And I always see it as a complementary uh, resource rather than something that replaces the available uh, data that, is, yeah, that we're observing. So you should see it as a complementary uh, water source. What we also see is that more and more of the data sources are open access available. So there's processing of the remote sensing uh, data and remote sensing observations. Uh, and they become already pre-packaged, um, uh, made available. So the, the slide or the image that you see here is the Vapor uh, database that is hosted by FAO, where IHE is also a partner in implementing the project. Uh, and you see that uh, the remote sense or the sensors are observing different uh, components. It's then processed into different uh, products. And that is then available um, free of, uh, of charge for everybody who wants to uh, access it. So, um, and this is just one of the resources, there are many other sources that are available. Um, I would like to share a little bit uh, information about some of the work that we're doing in one of the countries, and uh, that is Jordan. Uh, some background information is the second water scarce country in the world. There's a lot of uh, issues around uh, the sharing of the water resources, there are a lot of transboundary basins, they're computing water uses within the basin, but also between the countries. Uh, we've got declining water levels in the Dead Sea, which is uh, the end point of the Jordan River Basin. So you can see that there's a lot of overusage in the, in the river. And there's also a low efficiency of, um, of the water resources. So as a result, a lot of uh, people and a lot of sectors have uh, resulted into using groundwater. And as a result, groundwater is now being over abstracted. Uh, and there's a lot of well, what they call illegal use of, of groundwater, especially in certain areas, agriculture has uh, developed more wells and they're using water that is uh, not um, yeah, licensed by the, the government. So as a result, you see here um, uh, yeah, the map of, uh, of Jordan, some studies that um, uh, the ministry has done with BGR uh, that yeah, you see that there's a lot of drawdown. So the, the colors, the red colors, are the, the magnitude of drawdown of the groundwater resources. And you see in, in many areas where they have data, and the other areas they don't have the data, uh, that the water table is going down uh, substantially. And in some cases, and you see here, uh, some of the areas and some of the, the monitoring wells whereby the groundwater is declining rapidly, and in some cases even up to 10 meters a year. So that's substantial. Um, so what is then the impact of these, uh, these drawdowns? Um, we see in this particular graph, you see the, the contour lines and they've changed the contour lines. So even the flow direction of the, the groundwater uh, has changed, which also results in some area that 
um, if the, the groundwater uh, direction flow is changing, that some saline water is coming into the area. So there's some salinity of wells because they are also because of the drawdown, uh, they're tapping now into more saline uh, aquifers. Um, there's uh, a wetland that is a bit on the east side of, of Jordan, which used to be a natural wetline, wetland where the groundwater was really at the surface. And now the groundwater is about 100 meters deep in some of these places. And they're actually pumping groundwater into the wetland to maintain it because it also is a, um, a touristic uh, situation or a touristic location. So it's, it's quite significant what is happening. And what you see on the other slide, this is like cross section of the Jordan. So you've got the highlands and the Jordan Valley. And because the water table in the highlands is going down, a lot of the springs that are coming out in the Jordan Valley are also drying up as a result. Um, well, then how do we manage these, these uh, resources? And there are basically two uh, major unknown uh, information in this basin to, to make it and uh, to manage the water resources adequately. And you see in the map the number of wells that is um, abstracting groundwater. Uh, and on the left hand side, you also see uh, the, the magnitude of the wells. And some of them are government, they, they, are, they have a license, they're maybe for uh, groundwater resources for large um, cities. But there are also a lot of uh, the purple dots are a lot of private wells that are uh, unmonitored and they don't really know how much water uh, they are abstracting from the groundwater. So, one of the unknown is really uh, what is the safe yield? How much can you extract from these uh, groundwater sources? Uh, without affecting and, and lowering the water table even more. And, and ideally, you will even want to get to a, a point where you actually can recover the groundwater resources. And then at the same time, you also want to know how much is actually being abstracted currently and could you maybe penalize some of the users in those areas. So how can we use remote sensing uh, and, and the vapor data to provide more and better estimates on these, uh, these topics? Um, so what uh, we're doing uh, at IHE, uh, we're working, so this is, and maybe the students that are here, you can also be on one of my slides uh, maybe next year. So this is some work that we're doing with one of the students here, um, where we're developing an, a dynamic soil water balance model, whereby we're using these kind of open databases and open data sources um, to estimate groundwater recharge. Um, so one of the, uh, and this is linked also to the water accounting work that we're doing in the team here at IHE. Uh, one of the advantages of the work that we're doing and using the actual ET is that um, we have an algorithm that estimates and also the irrigation application rather than having that as an unknown input. Um, we are currently running the model at the monthly time step. We also would like to uh, increase the time step to get better like the the intensity of the rainfall and how that affects the, the recharge. Um, and we're also looking uh, and working with the ministry to validate it against uh, observed groundwater levels. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing this currently, Jordan is also using uh, only the annual values of rainfall to estimate the groundwater recharge um, and only based on, um, yeah, on the, the rainfall. So we hope that by this we get more um, provides more spatially distributed estimates on groundwater recharge in, uh, in Jordan. Then the second one is um, estimating how much water is being used in, um, in, uh, yeah, from agriculture and abstraction. And we also see that the vapor data could actually provide some information around that. Um, we again use this uh, soil water balance model that actually splits and, and checks whether or not the evaporation is as a result of the rainfall that fell on that pixel, or if there's more evaporation than you can expect from the rainfall. And we attribute that to, uh, to irrigation or water application or deep groundwater abstraction. Uh, and we call that blue ET. Um, so that's one thing that we can estimate. Uh, and we, we think that that blue ET is very much related to uh, the withdrawals from the, the wells, from the abstracted water. Um, another estimate is just uh, estimating effective rainfall and subtracting that from the, the vapor um, evapotranspiration. Um, unfortunately, uh, the database in Jordan is currently covered by 100 meter resolution and actually a lot of the fields and the, um, yeah, the, the farms in Jordan uh, are not well 
you know, identified with that, uh, that resolution data. Um, but there is some algorithms that you can reproduce the data and you see here some images of the actual evaporation um, map using 130 uh, meter resolution Landsat data. And in the graph you see that we compared or that FAO uh, compared the abstractions that were estimated using the remote sensing with the actual abstractions from the, the farms and there's actually a very good correlation between the two. So it, it shows that there is a, a good possibility to really identify where is the water being used and how much is being abstracted from uh, the data. And um, there is a nice clip also and if you follow Twitter you can uh, to look it up uh, and the, the link is actually behind the, the black box uh, on uh, some of the work that uh, FAO has done in, in this basin, in this area in, um, uh, in Jordan on how to use the, uh, the vapor data to estimate and provide information around this concept. And then finally, uh, well, most of the images that I presented came from some of the resources. There's a project website of the vapor database. Uh, the portal, there's also a link to the portal. You can contact FAO if you have questions and if you're really interested you can also follow uh, a training course and in the next couple of years we will be de developing more training opportunities and applications and use of the database. Thank you. Thank you very much for Luz, for your interesting presentation and to see what you can do with all the uh, technology and the data. Um, so next I want to invite Simon uh, to give us a presentation. Um, Simon is a hydrologist working at Acacia Water. Uh, so yeah, I'll give you the floor. Okay, so uh, good afternoon everyone. Also uh, those joining online, hope you uh, stick on for a while. Um, so thanks once again for the opportunity to also uh, present some of the well user cases or examples from the field in groundwater management. Um, we've heard a lot of the challenges already um, uh, and uh, indeed uh, what we see in the field that uh, groundwater is often seen as an infinite resource um, which we can uh, uh, tap unlimited, uh, but yeah, unfortunate that is not the case because if we use it non-sustainable, um, yeah, we will face dry wells, uh, water shortages. Um, we see conflicts over water arising in the field. Um, we see uh, that an increasing amount of fossil reserves uh, get depleted. Um, uh, yeah, and in the end, um, uh, this will result in low economic returns um, uh, for those using the water. Um, and actually, what we see is that that groundwater plays a crucial role in water availability, and therefore, uh, yeah, we, yeah, that's that's a reason to appreciate it very well and to exploit it wisely. Um, so, to dive a bit into the challenges we see into the field. Um, um, one of the uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, most pressing things we see is that the general overview of what resources are, uh, what resources are available, uh, that that overview is lacking. Um, so in areas there's um, little knowledge on how much water is actually available for use and um, uh, whether this is uh, replenished on an annual basis or not. Um, and if we then look at uh, groundwater development um, and the tapping of new resources, uh, we see often that the capacity uh, to do this, uh, either to de decide where water is available, um, or on which depth it is available, um, but also uh, the capacity on how to manage it properly, uh, how to determine a safe yield, uh, also as uh, uh, Malus was already mentioning, um, uh, that those principles, basic principles and basic knowledge uh, on the ground is lacking. Um, and that, for example, if, um, um, uh, if we work together with implementers or, or practitioners, uh, 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 well, uh, drilling companies, we also see that uh, guidelines or protocols to develop wells um, 
um, uh, yeah, are either of uh, insufficient uh, quality um, um, uh, or are not uh, maintained or valued as such, um, uh, leading to uh, uh, wells uh, being placed at the, um, at the wrong location uh, or the success rate uh, with which groundwater wells are drilled um, is, is very low. Um, and also what Elizabeth was men mentioning, um, in uh, acknowledging groundwater as a precious resource, uh, um, uh, we see that the financi financing behind it um, uh, to appreciate it as such uh, is also lacking behind. Uh, so um, if we want to capacitate on groundwater develop development, on the uh, sustainable use of it, um, uh, then also the financing component uh, uh, yeah, uh, should uh, yeah, uh, be increased on that uh, uh, to, to also uh, appreciate it as such uh, and to preserve it for, for also the future generations. Um, so I will now give you some of, uh, of, uh, of the examples, of practical examples which we apply into the field uh, in, in um, opening up uh, basically the, the invisibility of groundwater. Um, one of the things we do is, um, is, uh, is what we call groundwater mapping um, and that is actually uh, to inform what I just explained, this, this uh, well drilling process um, uh, to uh, basically inform on which locations are best to start the drilling, to increase the drilling rate success um, and um, um, uh, also have a, a kind of a fact-based view on what actually is available. Um, so the pictures you see here on the slide are, um, are from Ethiopia, um, uh, where we both uh, uh, practice now some shallow groundwater mapping as well as the deep groundwater mapping. Um, and uh, to give one clear example of a project we are currently in, uh, is the hydro uh, hydrogeological mapping for climate resilient wash. Uh, which is funded by the, uh, by the FCDO, so the, the British Development Agency. Uh, and this is a project we currently conduct for the Ministry of Water and uh, Energy in Ethiopia. Um, and we basically uh, follow a, a four-step approach um, in which we uh, first combine data uh, available on hydrogeology, geology, um, uh, recharge uh, and combine that in a sort of an overlay analysis uh, by which we get a groundwater potential map uh, and by also estimating uh, the, um, um, uh, the water demand by combining population numbers uh, and, uh, uh, and attach a, a certain water demand on it we get a water demand map and if we combine those two we actually see those areas uh, which should be targeted, where more uh, water has to become available, uh, but also which are high potential for, for uh, groundwater development. And those uh, target maps uh, we use to inform uh, the field work. Um, um, so, as the presentation is named Boots on the Ground, this really implies that um, uh, Field work is necessary to either validate those locations uh, by hydrogeological assessments, by geophysics, um, um, and in the end to combine this with expert judgment uh, to define the exact locations where uh, the success rate for, for a drilling exercise will be highest. Um, and we see also the, the positive effect for, for this approach. Um, uh, indeed, the success rate becomes higher um, and it also um, yeah, um, uh, uh, opts for, for having this, um, uh, this pre-assessment before actually going into the field. Um, one of the other things uh, which uh, the other presenters also uh, stress the importance of is actually um, ensuring that groundwater also becomes replenished, recharged. 
um, and one of the recent activities we did is, is um, uh, mapping uh, the recharge potential or the rainwater harvesting potential uh, for the Sahel region. Um, actually to, to show on which locations with which, which practical interventions um, uh, you can recharge the shallow groundwater. Um, so that it, um, uh, yeah, uh, that this resource becomes available on a seasonal basis. Um, and you also avoid um, uh, the, the use of, of deeper groundwater layers, uh, which ca cannot be replenished easily. Um, one of the other things uh, that is important to, um, um, to map is what is actually a risk, what are the risks for developing groundwater in certain areas. Um, and um, this is a demand for by, by donors, by NGOs, by local governments, uh, but also by uh, invest investors uh, trying to get feet on the ground in a certain area. Um, so one of the things uh, uh, that we also developed uh, is a kind of groundwater impact scan, uh, which shows you the risk in a certain area um, with respect to groundwater quality, uh, groundwater quantity, um, and tells you whether a certain area is in high risk uh, uh, for uh, either groundwater shortages or, or uh, a bad water quality, um, uh, and tells you some of the strategies you can apply to, um, to either overcome this um, or, or to avoid any uh, further risks to, uh, to occur. Um, and one of the ways we also uh, try to do uh, in making the invisible visible is to visualize trends uh, on groundwater development. And um, Marloes was already um, uh, telling a bit on this, um, that there are uh, widely available uh, and open source databases um, that you can use to get an uh, insight in uh, the groundwater availability. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Simon. And last but not least, we have a student from AFG Delft to tell the story about groundwater in Pakistan. Um, Maha Sheikh, uh, Maha, Maha serves as Sub-Divisional Officer in Punjab Education Department, Pakistan and currently a student of Hydraulic Engineering and Information Development at IHDF. I want to invite Maha to tell us about this story more. Good afternoon. I'm Maha and I, uh, I will be uh, talking about groundwater situation in Pakistan, historical overview and challenges. So Pakistan is basically an agriculture country and uh, where agriculture contributes about 20% of the total GDP of the country, whereas uh, the groundwater contributes about 76% of the total irrigation done in the country. Pakistan is currently the fourth largest user of groundwater in the world. So the contribution of surface water to irrigation is only 24%. Whereas 53% is conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater, and on 23% uh, is uh, solely done by groundwater. So I'll uh, go through the historical overview. Before 1960, only small scale abstraction of groundwater was done. In 1960, Indus Water Treaty was signed between India and Pakistan. After that, large-scale expansion of canal, uh, canals was carried out and there was a problem of water logging and salinity and a project known as uh, Salinity Control and Reclamation Project was launched in 1960. After that, number uh, uh, several uh, tube wells were installed uh, starting with uh, 17,000 tube wells in the scheme and uh, the number uh, increased tremendously, especially in the drought period during 1996 to 2001 in which uh, the number of tube wells increased to about 59% due to reduction in surface water up to 26%. So, in 
So currently, an average decline of 0.92 meter per year is observed in the country. That's quite alarming, right? Here are some facts and figures. So in 1960, the number of tube wells were about 30,000, whereas in 2018, the number of tube wells has been increased to about 1.36 million. The contribution of groundwater to irrigation was about 8% in 1960, and currently the contribution of groundwater to irrigation is about 75%. The water availability per capita was about 6,000 meters square in 1960 and currently it's 1,070 meter cube per capita. So here are a few factors contributing to groundwater depletion. Obviously population growth and increasing water demand is one of the factor. Peripheral growth uh, due to urbanization because uh, 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 impermeable land has been increased and the uh, uh, reduction in groundwater recharge has been observed. So depletion, this all is also contributing to groundwater depletion. Here are some of the few uh, facts and figures regarding the water ex extensive crops such as wheat, sugarcane and rice. In 1960, the production of wheat, sugarcane is, and rice was quite low as compared to 2017 figures. We can see that uh, the production of rice has been increased to about eight times the production of rice, rice in 1960. And about 80% of the irrigation water used for irrigation in Pakistan is used for irrigating uh, uh, wheat, sugarcane, rice and cotton. Here are a few of the major challenges faced in Pakistan. Uh, obviously, the most important one is uh, depletion of groundwater which is declining at a rate of 0.92 meter per year. Climate change is also causing, uh, is also a uh, major challenge as it's increasing the demand, water demand. Due to excessive pumping, deterioration in groundwater quality has been observed. And uh, also there was uh, very little management of groundwater resources in the very start. And uh, some practices are now there, but uh, it's uh, way too less to manage groundwater. This is just a graph uh, showing the trend in increase in the number of tube wells over the years. So it can be seen from 97,000 in 1970, it's like uh, 1.36 million in 2017 to 18. Here is a trend of groundwater depletion in the most populous region of the province of the country, which is Punjab. So in Punjab, it can be seen that more than 50% of the cultivated land has uh, groundwater depth below 6 meters. Having a quick, a quick overview of the groundwater depletion, Balochistan province, uh, a decline of 2 to 3 meters per year has been observed. And in Lahore city, which is the capital of the province of Punjab, uh, 0.92 meters per year decline is observed. There is the effect of cli uh, climate change on uh, water demand. It can be seen that the water demand is expected to be increased tremendously keeping in view the climate change scenario. So here is a comparison of groundwater quality in 2007 and 2014. The pink areas are showing the unfit water for irrigation and drinking purposes. It can be seen that the pink area the unfit water, quantity of unfit water has been increased tremendously in 2014 as compared to the figures in 2007. So 21% of the province of Punjab soil is salinized and 43% in Sindh province has been salinized. There are a few efforts by, done by the government of the Pakistan for uh, better groundwater management, such as the licensing system was introduced to restrict the uh, installation of tube wells over the uh, province. After that, uh, Punjab Irrigation and Drainage Act was also inter, uh, established in 1977, to, uh, which defined groundwater, groundwater rights. So there is an institution working uh, known as Pakistan Council of Research and Water Resources 
which is working for a groundwater recharge at different locations in the country by groundwater mapping. Also, the projects of rainwater harvesting have been done by PCRWR, Pakistan Council of Research in Groundwater Resources, to uh, different projects are in continuation. Currently, all important policy documents, such as the National Water Policy, the National Climate Change Policy, the National Food Policy, uh, emphasize on the groundwater restoration. There are also a few interesting projects uh, launched by the government of Pakistan. One is uh, Recharge Pakistan, which is uh, currently based on adoption of uh, ecosystem-based strategies in the country to have better climate resilience and uh, better food and water security. One very uh, interesting project is 10 billion uh, tree tsunami uh, afforestation project. 10 billion tree tsunami afforestation project in which uh, 10 uh, billion trees are expected to be planted for uh, better vegetation cover and climate, uh, uh, climate uh, resilience. So, are we too late for groundwater management? Maybe, but uh, there is always a way forward. So, I'll discuss some of them. So, better implementation of the licensing system should be done, as the licensing system is there for uh, restricting the use of groundwater, but it's not very well implemented. <coughs> Different projects uh, on rainwater harvesting and the groundwater recharge are already in progress, but it's on, it's on a very small scale. More emphasis should be given on these projects. So uh, currently, uh, the trend in irrigation sector of Pakistan is uh, using the flood irrigation. So we should shift from flood irrigation to drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation system. So, irrigation practices such as alternate wet and dry irrigation should be adopted. So, the efficiency of irrigation system can also be improved by reducing the water losses such as uh, uh, seepage losses and conveyance losses indirectly uh, by either lining of the canals. Reuse of water should be optimized. So one of the important uh, way forward is changing crop patterns. So basically, as we, I already discussed that water is 80 percent of the water of uh, used is used for irrigating wheat, rice, sugarcane, and cotton in Pakistan. So these are very uh, water extensive crops. We can uh, move uh, from water extensive crop to less uh, water consuming crops as well. Also, crop patterns can be changed, different st uh, studies can be done to change uh, crop patterns such a way to optimize the yield and uh, uh, minimize the uh, shortage of water. And uh, as uh, we already done in our master studies as well using Ribosome software, so uh, I, I, could, I could tell you that uh, changing crop patterns can have a huge impact on uh, yield of uh, crops and uh, reducing the shortage of water. So this is all from my side. much for uh, presenting to us the case of Pakistan. Um, yeah, so we have had a lot of uh, speakers giving us their presentations about many different topics related to groundwater. Uh, and we now have about 10 minutes uh, for your questions. So I would like to invite the speakers to the stage and the audience to uh, think of any questions they want to ask to the speakers of today. <coughs> Okay, so uh, who has any questions for one of the speakers or for all? Yeah, you so, so. <laughs> yes. So I, I have a question about the uh, low acceleration framework, which is being developed by the UN. Uh, they say for integrated water management, uh, there is a lack of innovation, governance, capacity building, finance, uh, and there's one more. 
I'm trying to find out, is there for groundwater a specific uh, point in this accelerator that is of importance? Or is, does it differ from country? Or are they all of importance? Uh, is it innovation? Is it capacity building? Is it governance? Is it finance? Data? Oh, data is yeah. one. Yeah. I think you mentioned them all. They're all important. What you also see in the last presentation, the solution is not one, it's all. So we need end data, end targets, and 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 it's all. And that makes it difficult for different kinds of discipline, different kinds of uh, approaches, different kinds of uh, end users to make that happen. So uh, yeah, the, the next level from my point of view would be uh, by combining these different kinds of uh, topics, as you mentioned, and uh, showcase that that if you combine it into the area, then you can make steps instead of only focus on let's say three or four, two of the things you mentioned. Yeah, 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 so, so I think that's also um, uh, key in what we uh, see the work of Acacia, so um, and what you also see uh, taking ground in the last years is taking a holistic approach uh, to this, indeed by, by integrating uh, yeah, different disciplines. Um, and that is, yeah, key uh, in managing the groundwater uh, and the water source resources as a whole. And you see the four levels of groundwater development and management. What I see in this meeting this afternoon that on the, the level of, of knowledge, uh, the, the assessment and the and the, and the the management, the monitoring on the technical side is developing very, very fast, especially with this remote sensing tools, etc. In terms of development of groundwater, its private sector is very active because they can make money out of drilling wells or uh, uh, building the, the, the water systems around the wells, etc. So it all comes back to the management, uh, and that's also what I, in preparing the, pre the, the, the presentation, I came to this feeling. It's all about the management. We know exactly how management has to be done. In the management are the topics you mentioned. It's the capacity. Yeah? The, the level of knowledge in certain countries is different. Yeah? It's the, the strength of the legislation, yeah? the, the power of the government. So I think in each, in the countries where I work, I see it everywhere that it's those issues on the management, yeah, the non-technical side, the non-knowledge side, yeah, uh, and it's different in each country, yeah, it's different aspects, but that's where uh, you have to take all your efforts in yeah, to make that stronger, and then the technology and the knowledge will follow very easily, and is now far ahead of it, yeah. and, and that's, that's definitely, definitely the, the difficult part of the whole equation, and that's why it's, uh, you know, it's it's forgotten often, and it's uh, and even after you know having worked 40 years in groundwater development, I, I don't see a solution rather than uh, capacity development of individuals. Yeah? And they can find their way in the system to come up in the right position. So capacity development for me is uh, number one, and I think IHA is a perfect location to uh, to make this commitment. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, I see some people here. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, I, work in, uh, I used to work in an international setting, now I work for the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Water. And um, I, I would like to know from you all who can cheer me up. Because I've become a little bit pessimistic about the situation. We, the, 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 the solution of declining tables is also very much linked to. The, uh, the agriculture, which has gotten a big boost from uh, accessing groundwater, but it's, it's a huge political economy as well. You cannot just say to farmers, stop doing that. You, you will create uh, revolutions. Uh, at the same time, the, the solutions which are presented on management, uh, manage aquifer recharge, at least in the Netherlands, we, we are realizing, and I think all over the world, the, the, the low levels of uh, uh, PFOA and the, all those other forever chemicals, uh, the effects that they have on our drinking water, and uh, we, it's, it, there are a lot of doubts whether that's just uh, that's the way forward. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm becoming yeah, a little bit pessimistic on what are the ways out of this situation. We cannot access it uh, siloed, 
uh, at the same time, if you integrate everything, you will stall forever everything. So please, cheer me up. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe I, I still uh, the ideas from your side where you see you need to understand, you know, what the, the issue is and that there's real, I mean, you need to see the urgency of the problem before, you know, people take action. And then I think your side really showed that, you know, you get this uncontrolled uh, utilization of the groundwater. But once you, you find out and you really realize that it is an issue, people start taking action and, and making, uh, hopefully, the right decisions to, to start managing it, it more properly. So I think the fact that it, people are more realizing that it is an issue, it actually calls for this, uh, this change and, and a call for action to manage them more sustainably than uh, we've been doing in the past. So that was, uh, I'm sorry I stole your... Uh, <laughs> no, no, <it's> your <laughs> Yeah, I maybe I don't even I agree with that. It's it's awareness creating awareness, but also see a good good examples of good management. Also see examples with the manager for Richard that say uh, many years ago it was not there. Now you see I see in the Netherlands it's really a boost. It's it, it wasn't not there 15 years ago. No manager for recharge, the uh, small scale system. Now we have farmers. We have uh, in that Acacia doing many things in in, in, in Sparwa, that we see many examples that it works and also the Delta program they suddenly recognize that small-scale solutions are part of a bigger solution. And it was not there in the beginning. They all, only thought in, 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 in uh, big systems, big water supply systems. I see that is shift in the Netherlands. And, and also with, with the new uh, generation, uh, especially in big, I think really in IEC, if we, we create here in IEC the new directors, the new persons in charge. And the problem, my problem would be that it takes too long. It, it should be faster. So they should be just fast in charge of, of, of really uh, knowing the awareness and getting into uh, better solutions. Yeah. Yes, the, the, more the, questions? The yeah. Yes. yeah, of course. <laughs> 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 okay, so you have your on how to solve it. Oh, sorry. Khaled Ali, master student here at IG. Uh, actually, in the first presentation, it was mentioned that uh, ground groundwater can be uh, part of solution and can be part of uh, of problem. What do you mean by part of problem? <laughs> to solve a water crisis. So well, we have water, so what, uh, how can it be part of the problem? Well, yeah. thank you. Um, so I think we, we all know how we should be dealing with groundwater. The fact is also that we've gotten ourselves, painted ourselves in, 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 a, in a tight spot, in a corner. Yeah? That was your question. Uh, so the question really becomes how how to, to deal with that. So uh, you know it's too simple to think ah we have a water problem. That was my point with the introduction. Uh, we have a water problem and groundwater is the solution. No groundwater has been a long time already part of the problem. And uh, you you create uh, with with supply you create demand. And you can't just uh, abandon uh, shit. I mean. Uh, for people to be deciding to leave their fields, to leave their homes, you know, that's, 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 that's massive. Um, so groundwater is already part of the, the problem. And it, 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 if that's sufficient answer for you, I take the opportunity to take a, to ask a question myself, because it's related to this, this, this point. Um, so and not being on the stage, I can ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my, my question really is, uh, I, I, I see parallels with the energy transition. And we know, we decided, we need for a sustainable future, we need to say goodbye to fossil. Is it wise, is it ethical to be developing fossil groundwater, creating a demand that we know is going to be sustainable? What, you know? Who? Oh. <laughs> I don't suggest I do no. <laughs> this issue, yeah, because you know, there are many articles. Uh, also, you know, it's, it's only a small part of the, of the total volume. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, if you want to, if you're in a situation that you need this fossil water, because it's the only groundwater which I've been, but it's probably deep down, yeah, so it's an expensive solution. So it, there will not be many places yeah, where the fossil groundwater is your actually first choice because there are no alternatives and then I think then it's economic socio-economic yeah, uh, 
position, it's the government, the, the manager have to take, are we going to tap it now? Because in 10 years we have another solution. We can desalinate our brackish water from shallower depths. So it's a political, social, economic, political decision of the government at the spot. Yeah? And we cannot, we cannot give the guidelines there. Political is short term, often less than that part of the problem. Yeah, they, they, they take the decisions. Yeah, but, but sometimes, first of all, you see uh, Norway, they do it smart. They, they do the oil extraction and the production. They put it on the bank and safeguard this budget for later, for, for the future. And, and, and it should be like that, but I don't think it will happen always. But I think it could be for 10, 15 years possibility. I'm not in favor of that because it's mining. But if you can do that in 10, 15 years and you can safeguard this budget and you can create economical development and, and, and bring the level of people to a higher status, more health, more uh, uh, happiness basically, and then uh, safeguard a part of this budget you earn for later developments, and that is maybe an intermediate possibility for people living now. Uh, I'm not against it, I don't think it's always possible, it's often not possible because the government's situation is not good enough, but that could be a possible possibility for me, from my point of view, maybe uh, also in Africa I would say certain places. But it's not political correct to say that, I would say. Many people complain about this approach. I'm sorry, but we're, uh, we're running out of time, so I suggest we continue this discussion uh, later. But I have one please. question for her, and what do, what do you think as a, as a solution for the things you put over there? I, I, can we finish with that as a young person who has ideas of the future? <laughs> <laughs> do you really believe in your uh, approach? Yeah, groundwater uh, recharge system is the approach that should uh, need emphasis. And uh, I think that's the way out. <laughs> Uh, before closing the session, we will watch one other video, so it is from IG students. Um, okay, this is um, a film, and the title is A Wake Up Call, Quota and Sanitation in Invisible Syrian Refugee Camp. So, this video describes the refugees' everyday challenges to access uh, water and sanitation in their camp, located in northern Syria and bordered by Turkey. This video is a it around the water and sanitation routine of a family. It begins with the father who works as a water contractor to deliver water to the refugees and his family. Then the mother answers questions about the conditions and sanitation, and sanitation facilities in the camp. Now we can watch the video. This video is made by uh, Liv Dema, one of the IG students. And also it can be uh, watched in YouTube if you want to watch the game. Yet, the home for 20 families, like the ones of Khalid Abu Abud. He, his mother, wife, and six kids were forced to leave their roots and memories in villages and cities, and move around 50 kilometers as northern as possible. Settled seven years ago in the outskirts of Azaz city, closer to the settlement border with Turkey, they try to survive.
والعيله الصغيره يعني كفين هذا الفين يقصروا وياهم الصيف كباي صغير في التراكتور 15 يورو والسياره 5 يورو 7 امتار 25 يورو وال 5 امتار 15 يورو في نفسها وقت الشرب وقت الغسيل نفسها يعني في مي ما يصاب هذا ولا الشرب ما يصاب يعني يعني باشر هذا بس اني لو اطفال الاصغر ما يصاب يعني مي جنسيه بس شو يسوي الواحد يعني بهذا الحقيقه مي له قيمه يعني تعرف According to recent reports published by UNHCR and UNICEF in 2021, 6.2 million internally forced displaced Syrians are trained to live with the simplest means available and take care of their families. Their humanitarian situation is currently at stake. Despite the limited awareness and media coverage in the region, moreover, there might be a family like them in the outskirts of many cities and countries where people are forced to live and live in precarious conditions. Wouldn't you care about them? Um, now we want to invite Job to do the closing remarks of today. We're lucky. We still have the pictures. I mean, we still have videos because there's too much to to discuss or to to conclude. Okay.
because it's already the drinks are already waiting. So I made notes of every presentation, but I will skip it. I will just say three things. One is of course all the presenters. Thank you for all the inspiring presentations and the notes here in the discussion. So we give a big applause to the presenters. And also to our, our uh, moderators. <laughs> we forgot the flowers, but you were here. Um, you have, I said I have three points. One thing has been after the discussion, what, what I noticed, I noted four points. In fact, which is then three more or less takeaways. There's an overall more attention to the management and governance. Realize that groundwater is a buffer. Capacity building remains a priority, and then bridge the gap between the policymaker and the innovators. These are the, the four points I think we should have as a takeaway from this one. Now, what I just, what I notice is that the word management was quite often used, and I think we also should try to see that management does not become a kind of a buzzword because it, it's it comprises, as you mentioned, comprises so many issues. I mean, it's the level of, 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 of management. And then the power relations. I mean, in every country, the power relations are completely different. Right? And there are reasons why some people misuse the water. And so the power relations are crucial. And then, of course, the priority in allocations. That the allocation demand. I didn't hear the word allocation demand. I think you mentioned in the first, the supply and demand. And this, of course, is key. In fact, and that, I think, is, is something also we should see in the a, in a next, next discussion that we focus is a kind of continuation. So, diversifies the economy, for example, is, of course, an issue, right? is a solution. And not only how to, how to manage the groundwater. Um, The second thing is, um, what I know is the fact is that, as you mentioned, the data we are all aware, and there is sufficient data. What is also, what was also shown today, I think, is that we had a lot of presentation with really in-depth information. And so, it means also you need finance to do this. And if you look to Pakistan or you look to the Netherlands, you notice that the reserves institutions in the Netherlands, I've never seen a comparison between the number of reserves institutions here and the number of reserves introduced in Pakistan. And so the finance of the government deliberately to focus on this, of course, that is also related to the power balance. And so this, I said the management issue is, 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 quite, is quite important. Now the last one I have is that, referring back to the, the, the timeline of, of Albert, we are here today, but if, I don't know whether you will make the next bullet in your timeline, so we do, do, do that in 10 or 20 years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So what could we, how do we feel ourselves in the next bullet on the timeline? He made all kinds of steps in the timeline. Now, are we just continuing? Or what kind of bullet do we think we put in the timeline of today? Because what we have today is history tomorrow. And so what, so that is something to think of. Thank you all, and the drinks are ready. <laughs> Thank you.